So we're talking about God's presence. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go off script for a second. So something that's really cool about that song is just, uh, to me, you know, we think about um, how, you know, we get our purpose from God when, in reality, maybe we should be seeking for, for God's presence. And, and that there are times where, you know, we say we can know of God, but do you really know God? When, when, you, when Jesus sees you, is he going to say, I know you and I love you? Or is he going to say, get away from me, I never knew you? Uh, kind, of, kind of scary. But anyways, uh, to kick off today, last week we were in James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, which says, I'm going to jump down to verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So we see here that, kind of a recap of last week, that we need to continue to persevere. And we need to grind. We do this so that we can be finished and complete, not lacking anything. We go through this, this purification, sanctification process so that we can aspire to be that, that gem that God has made us to be. And so that no matter the circumstances in our life, whether it's good and great and things are going just amazing or bad, horrible, suffering, that we consider it pure joy due to God's love and promises that he has for each and every one of us. When we consider it pure joy, God uses your suffering and he uses the trials that you may be going through. They, it may be confusing. You don't know why you're going through this, whether it's good or bad. And you don't know why. Know this. Know that, that God uses your suffering and your testimony to help bring others back to him. So let me tell you a story about my brother. So for the most part, my brother and I, I would say we were, we were good kids. Uh, of course, if some people from my past heard that, they'd roll their eyes. Uh, but my brother and I were half-brothers, yet we would always just call, um, we would always just say, you know, we're brothers, full on. So he's four years older than me. He's from at Atlanta, GA. And um, if you saw him, you have no idea that he is my brother. And so here's a picture. I know it's a, it's a little random. He and I... I mean, maybe other than the eyes and the eyebrows, I don't know. Other than that, we don't look too much alike. Not very similar. Uh, and so I have an interesting story about my brother when he was way, way younger. Um, I don't even think I was alive when this happened. Um, but my brother, like most kids, he would run around outside. He'd have a good time, you know. He'd play, and he would frolic, and, you know, just care, not a care in the world. And so our parents, they told him, Matthew... You need to wear shoes and socks because you don't want to step on something that can hurt you. You don't want to step on glass or something sharp or something that could possibly sting you. So my brother, like I said, you know, he's at that age, you know, everything's good. The world's sunshine, rainbows, and yay me. And he was frolicking, and then zap, boom. My brother, <laughs> he stepped on a wasp, and... So if you can imagine, the wasp was not very fond of that. Um, and so I was, like I said, I was too young at the time to know what was going on. And so my parents, they would always bring up this humorous yet painful story. And so the moral of it is that, you know, maybe my brother was, you know, he may have just been too naive due to, to how young he was. But we can see here that my brother got stung for not believing and what my parents would say would happen if he, if he did not wear shoes. So the problem in our passage today is we were talking about this persecution last week. And so that's still the problem in James and so, that James is addressing. And so this, this persecution has caused this issue of how we get stung in life. And that when we get stung, it can kind of start some doubt. 
we get stung by doubt. So doubt can be so dangerous because doubt is the opposite of trust. So we see people in the Bible and all throughout Scripture that they get stung. I mean, I can't count how many times Israel got stung, but we see that Jonah, for example, Jonah was called by God to go and preach to Nineveh due to their sinful ways. Yet he got scared and he fled. He didn't want to do what God was calling him to do. He didn't want to, he didn't want to participate in God's will. He wanted to do his own will and impose what he wanted to do. He let his emotions and doubt cloud what was really important. And so Jonah let doubt consume him, and he was swallowed by a fish. That does not sound very fun. Um, so the next person I'm going to talk about that they let doubt take over was Peter. And so Peter, in my eyes, this guy, I mean, I love sports. I don't know about you, some of you guys anyways. But Peter was easily defensive player of the year. This guy, he denied Jesus three times. And he was full of doubt, you know, is this Jesus guy really legit, you know? And so when they were getting persecuted, and uh, they went up to Peter and like, hey, you know that Jesus guy over there? You're, you're affiliated with him, aren't you? And Peter's like, no, I am not. And literally before that, he said, Lord, I'll never abandon you. And so to me, that just goes to show, you know, we let doubt get in the way, and we get stung. And so Peter was full of doubt, and he rejected Jesus during that purification process when the going got hard and the pressure was on. Instead of being pressured and, and squeezed into that diamond, into that gym, into something finished and complete and pure, we see that, that Peter, he, didn't, he wasn't finished and complete, and he let the pressure turn him into dust. And yet he too was stung by doubt. And so in what ways, church, do we get stung when we don't believe in God? We don't believe to receive. What's something that we all hate? Whether it's the unknown, the future, what's going to happen next in life? And I think that life, it can beat us up. It can knock us down. It can be a drag out raw. And it can toss us back and forth. We can get unbalanced and let things of this world sting us over and over and over again. So here's a story by none other than Billy Graham about a guy who got stung. He was born in Italy, but came to the United States as a young man. He studied, studied juggling and he became famous throughout the whole world. So finally, he decided, he decided to retire, and he longed to return to his home country, and he wanted to settle down. So he took all his worldly possessions, and he, he booked a trip on a ship to Italy, and he invested all the rest of his money and his earthly possessions into one single diamond. He hid the diamond in his stateroom, and so while aboard the ship, he was showing a boy how he could juggle, and he was just using apples, and he was kind of showing off a little bit. And then eventually, a crowd gathered, and we're like, whoa, this guy, he's kind of, he knows what he's talking about. And so, the pride of the moment, and him relying on his own abilities, it went to his head. And he explained to the crowd that, that this diamond, he went and grabbed the diamond that was everything to him, and he said, you know this diamond right here? This is everything. This is my life savings. This is my baby. And he started juggling around. Instead of just with mere apples, he was using the diamond. So soon he was taking more and more chances, thinking, oh man, I'm, I am a stud. And he was tossed around this diamond. And at one point, he threw the diamond high into the air. The crowd gasped. They freaked out. Because they knew that this diamond meant so much to the juggler. They begged him, oh, please don't do that again. That was cool, but we don't want you to lose everything. But moved by the excitement of the moment and his pride and confidence in himself, the juggler he threw the diamond just, just a pinch higher. And again, the crowd gasped and they, 
They sighed in relief when he caught it again. So having total confidence in himself and his ability, he's like, I am the juggler. He, he took the diamond. He was like, one more time, watch this. And he threw it up. And he threw it up so high, it disappeared into the sky for a minute. And so when he threw it that high into the air, he, he was waiting for it to come back. So the diamond returned into view, sparkling in the sunlight. And at that moment, the ship kind of jolted a little bit. You know, it tilted, hit a little wave or something. I'm not 100% sure on that detail, but it jolted just a little bit. And that diamond, this man's baby, his all, went plunging into the sea. It was lost forever. So we all feel terrible about the man's loss and of all of his worldly possessions. But God compares our soul as more valuable than the possessions. Just like the man in the story, the juggler, some of us, we're juggling with our souls. We trust in ourselves and our own ability and the fact that, you know, I can do this. I can earn this myself. I can rely on me. And oftentimes there are people around us begging us, don't do it, don't do it, stop, you're going to mess up. Yet we take the risk anyways. And we continue to just keep juggling and juggling and juggling one more time, but never knowing when the ship of life is going to kind of tilt, maybe a little, a jolt or a wave or a storm. And we can lose our chance forever. So we see in this story that the juggler, he put his all, his livelihood into this worldly possession. And he was doing what he wanted in life. He believed in himself rather than trusting in God. And unfortunately, he too, he got stung because he was imposing his own will on his life rather than letting God's will be done. So how many times have we thrown up everything? We take our, our own personal gem, we throw it up, and so it's going to be okay. I have confidence in myself. How many times have we done this, church? We put everything on the line for something that's just worldly. We do whatever it takes to get a step ahead in life, even at the expense of our faith. Our priorities are out of line when we doubt God, and instead, you know, I'm going to trust in myself. When we let doubt win, that opens up the opportunity for us to sin. We want to do what we want to do rather than doing what God wants us to do. So doubt is the exact opposite of trust. So why? Why do we doubt? Why do we struggle with wanting to be selfish when we know we want to do these things of good? I think it explains it pretty good in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. It says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but on my own I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I think that we all, we struggle with this sinful nature. We struggle with these sinful desires. So, you know, you can give a thanks to Adam and Eve for that one. But no one is perfect. No one is sinless. And I don't care how good you may think you are, you know, I follow the Ten Commandments, I go to church every Sunday, and I fast, I um, participate in communion, and I read my Bible every single day. And, you know, and I think there's times where we say, you know, 
and our culture says that if we are a good person, that, you know, you're good. You can, you can get to salvation on your own through works and through what you do. So go on and read Leviticus if you want to realize, you know, a sin that you've been snared by. In Romans 3.23, it simply says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So for the good we want to do when we're following and loving Christ in our lives, when we're bearing fruit of the Spirit, making disciples of all nations, yet we still struggle so hard to do this. It's so hard to do what is good and what is right in the eyes of God, yet it is so easy to indulge in our sinful desires. We see a porn video, we click right on it with no hesitation Maybe it's you work all week and you know, oh, just wait until Friday so I'm going to get plastered with the boys. Or maybe by being a selfish parent, instead of caring for the child, you're, you're either abusive or you don't want to discipline them because you're too lazy to take care of the child. And so people say how millennials and, and Gen Z, that this, these generations are just a bunch of lazy, horrible people people who they just stay on their phone and they're the reason our country is is going into garbage and yada 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 when in reality I want to pose this question who raised these generations so yeah I mean and I'm not this isn't a soapbox you know I'm in Gen Z myself I'm not trying to just roast generations here but yet you may want to look in the mirror so how easy is it for us when we are at the store you know, or even here at the church, when we, instead of talking to people and having life-giving discussions and that are fruitful, it turns into something full of malice in regards to gossiping, spreading lies and rumors about people and putting people down to make ourselves feel better because we're too insecure. Our fruit goes from life-giving. It's luscious. It's beautiful. And it turns into something that has died, shriveled, and of no use to anyone. So these sins I listed, they're only a few. <laughs> Those are only a few sins. I'm not perfect either, but I'm going I'm to get off the subject of, of talking about sin for a second. So I struggle with this as well. So when I was in high school, I thought that I, know, I knew what I was going to do in life. I was like, you know, I mean, I look like it now, but I, um, I wanted to be an athlete. I was into basketball full on. Basketball was my God. And then reality slapped me in the face. I had a few deaths in my life that were people that were so close to me. My grandfather and my brother Darren Sions. And when these people passed, it was a slap in the face as to what is really important in life. I got stung. And so instead of relying on God's will in my life and, and letting him do what he needs to do, this purification process, I pushed him away. And I resorted to drugs. I resorted to alcohol to try and get through this, this hole that I had in my heart due to the broken world we live in. And yet, this stuff, it's literally like you get a funny story. I was a kid, I got a big gash on my head, and they glued it shut, and then they put a Band-Aid on it. And so it's literally, and then when I ripped it off, because I thought my head was healed, it ripped off the glue, started bleeding out again. So it's a temporary fix. It's like getting a massive cut and they glue it shut, put a band-aid on it and you just rip it off rather than getting the proper treatment you need, which is in what your relationship with Jesus. And it failed me, the alcohol, the drugs, it failed me again and again. I would get so drunk I didn't know what was going on. I would be so high that I would, I would come down from these highs and I would get so depressed and I would just want to get intoxicated again and again so that I would not know what was going on. I had this hole, and we talked about it last week, this hole, something was missing, yet I wanted to fill it with those things that are temporary. And so 
today, I have to continually remind myself to grind daily so that I fill it with God and don't let my sinful nature take over. I fill it with God so I had to consider it pure joy. And so the problem is the sinful nature that we've been talking about. And the sinful nature is fueled by the core of every single sin, pride. And you add a spark to the fuel when you doubt who God is because instead of trusting him, you, you become like that juggler that we were talking about and you think, you know, I'm pretty good. I can do what I want. I am that good. And so you add fuel to the fire when you doubt who God is because instead of trusting him, you turn to sin. And this wildfire of sin will turn you to ash and it will pressure you and it will consume you just like Peter and Jonah. I don't know if you'll get swallowed by a fish, but it could cause the pressure to be too much and you can get perished into dust. So how, church? You may be thinking, oh, this guy's really Debbie Downer today. He's saying some horrible stuff. So how can we deal with this pressure? How can we turn from dust into the diamond? And how can we deal with this problem of doubt? So we're going to be in James once again today. If you will turn there, I'm going to give you some background about what's going on. Whew. So James... James is a half-brother of Jesus, and he wrote this letter. Why did he write it, you may be thinking. And he wrote it to Jewish Christians who were being persecuted and killed. They were spread out all over the world due to this persecution. And in James 1 verse 1, which is something I kind of just, I ran over last week, it literally says, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. So this just goes to help to prove that these Jewish Christians were facing persecution. They fled. They had to spread out. And so that I can imagine with all of this doubt, this persecution, these hardships, it probably caused just a speck of doubt to start forming in these Jewish Christians and their hearts. And this spark would cause doubt. And so starting in James chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 5 through 8, if you want to read along with me. Starting in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So we see here that in verse 5, it talks about how we need to be asking for wisdom. And so you think, well, why should I care about wisdom? Why should I be continuously asking for it? What is the point? So what is wisdom? In our culture today, we think that that wisdom and, and knowledge are the same thing. So we think that knowledge means you're smart. Smart means you're powerful. Knowledge is power. But what if I told you that some of these guys that were considered to be the smartest people, some of the smartest people of all time, guys like Einstein, Freud, and Hawking, they thought they knew it all. They did it on their own. They grinded, and they're like, you know, I'm the smartest person ever, yet these guys, like last week that we talked about, these guys were missing something. And so they thought they knew everything, yet they knew nothing. So instead of knowledge, wisdom uses knowledge for its proper end. The furtherance of God's kingdom. And Don Stewart said that wisdom, it can be applied in these following ways I'm going to list to you. Through persecution, defending the faith, problem solving, and everyday living. So we're going to tackle each one individually. So we're going to start with through persecution. The Holy Spirit may grant the believer the word of wisdom when answering persecutors. And so Jesus, he promised this in Matthew 10, 18 through 20. And it says, and you will be brought before governors 
and kings for my sake. And as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles, but when they deliver you up, do not worry. Do not worry about what or how you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you, it's not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father who will speak in you. So now we're going to move on to defending the faith. And Stuart says, we are all instructed to defend the faith. We need to always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for this, this hope that they see in you. When they see, ah, oh, that guy's different. There's something about him that's different in a good way. So with meekness and fear, we need to be able to give a reason for this hope that we have. However, there are certain occasions when the word of wisdom is needed in answering unbelievers' questions about Christianity. Jesus exercised this many times. And here's an example. So then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. And they, like, they challenged Jesus. But after that, you know, they didn't dare ask him a question again. So we see here that Jesus knew the Pharisees' hearts when they were challenging him and saying, you don't know what you're talking about. And yet, Jesus, he alone had all wisdom. He alone had all knowledge. And he alone had all understanding. And so for us, this is exciting, this part right here. So get ready. So we have a supernatural Holy Spirit-enabled, God-given wisdom that comes from him when we are in times of need. That was a mouthful. Um, so when dealing with, these, with unbelievers and people that don't trust in us, we need wisdom because it is important so that we don't drive them away from God and we become a clown, but rather that we can defend our faith and also have grace on people. So pray to God that he would give you wisdom. Pray to God that he would give you wisdom. We need to believe to receive. And the next one we're going to talk about is problem solving. Stewart says, the word of wisdom can be also used when you're solving difficult problems. When the apostles were distracted from preaching the gospel because of business matters, they chose certain believers to help them as administrators. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over business. Wisdom helps out with solving problems. So before we, our next and last one that we're going to talk about on these four points um, is the everyday living with wisdom, but we're going to take a break from wisdom for just one second. So before we get there, we need to answer this question. So you're talking about wisdom. Is God a wise God? And your, your obvious answer will be like, yes. But we're going to dig more into that. Stuart says, the Bible says that God is wise. When we speak of the wisdom of God, it's a combination of all his knowledge and him being all-powerful. And so Paul wrote, Now, to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's in 1 Timothy 1, 17. So scripture testifies, and it proves that the God of the Bible is wise. Once again, I found this saying that we talked about just a second ago, that wisdom is more than just knowledge. Wisdom is the good use of your knowledge. God not only displays his wisdom, but he applies it. He wants you to be finished. He wants you to be complete and the best version of you possible. So God always does the wisest thing possible. And so... God always does the wisest thing possible and that we need to believe to receive wisdom. So we believe that God, God knows what's best for us because he alone created us and he has loved us from the beginning till now. His arms are open wide 
Are you going to believe to receive God's uh, love and wisdom? Or are you going to be full of doubt? Are you going to get stung? Are you going to let the grind continue to be finished and complete? Are you going to stay in stagnant, lukewarm waters of our culture? You know, there are a lot of people, and I'm saying the slogan, believe to receive. Some people just go, oh yeah, I believe that God and Jesus are real. But the problem is that even demons and the devil believe that Jesus and God are real. They acknowledge that. So are you going to let this love transform you? Are you going to receive it? Why does it matter that we receive it? It matters so that we can obey God and obey what he calls us to do, which is to love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself, and to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Trinity, and teaching them to observe all that God has commanded us. Are you going to do that? Or are you going to be selfish and doubt in God like Jonah and Peter did? Let the pressure turn you to dust. Live a life of the flesh. And so we talk about, you know, and we use this word in church a lot called love, and we talk about how we love people, we love our friends, we love our family. And we throw this word around without any meaning. But do we really know? Do we really know what love is? So Mark Winthy, Ben Stanley, and I, we, we've been do, reading this book together and just digging through it together. Um, it's called God Guy um, by Michael DeMarco. And he gives this really, really, really good definition of what love is. So the book said, how can you be sure that love isn't just a lovey-dovey feeling? Simple. God commands you to love. And since feelings can't be commanded, love can't be just a feeling and an emotion. See, I can't order you to be miserable right now. It's not possible to just activate those kinds of feelings. But actions can be commanded. I command you to stand on one foot, and you could do it, I hope. So, if God is commanding you to love, he isn't talking about how you feel about this guy or girl, you know. I just get this feeling when he walks in the room. No, it's not an emotion. It's not just a feeling. In reality, God says and commands us to love. Love is an action, not a feeling. So knowing God's love, which is sacrificial and unconditional, is something that is so important. We can never truly comprehend just how powerful God's love is for each and every single one of us. And so I hope when you read John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that no one shall perish but have eternal life. I hope that when you hear that, it's not just, oh, I've heard that scripture ever since I was six, that I hope that when you hear this scripture, it's not just words, but it's life-giving. Scripture is alive. God is alive. Jesus is alive. And that, this, that God's word, it sparks this joy because of what Jesus did and what he continues to do today and what he's going to do. He is the king of kings and no ruler, nation, or agenda can topple Jesus' reign of glory. And his glory is coming. Jesus won the battle for our salvation. So love is an action. And God put it into action when he sent his only son. He sent his son to take our sin, to wipe us clean. We're going to be white as snow, no sin, to make us look impure. And when Jesus took the full wrath of God for all of the sins for everyone that we have committed because of this pride, this sinful nature, we chose to go away from God. God doesn't choose to go away from us. He's sitting there waiting for you to come back to him. 
It's not a, oh, God hates me, God left me. No, you left God. So Jesus, when he died on the cross, he kicked out of death, and he won the ultimate match. Sorry, I'm a huge professional wrestling fan. Kind of a, yeah, guilty pleasure. Anyways, so this should be something that we rejoice in daily. Rejoice in this action, the ultimate action of love. And I may not know all the answers, but what I know for a fact is that God loves each and every one of us. And it's our decision if we're going to go back to the Father. Because his arms are open. He wants to embrace you no matter what you've done. You may think, my sin has separated me from God. I've done all these horrible things. I'm not a good person. I'm not like those church people that go every week. But in reality, his arms are open. It's on you if you're going to, going to trust in God's love. And so we see that those sins that stung Jonah and Peter, they too, they recovered. They got back up. They trusted in God's love and wisdom. They let God bring them home. They let God embrace them. And they went back to the Father. They believed and received God's love and wisdom. Jonah went on to preach to Nineveh because he now trusted in God's wisdom and love. Peter, after he denied Jesus three times, three times, three times, he too received and believed in God's love and wisdom. And so we see more about Peter, how this ended up for him. So in, in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said once again, take care of my sheep. And so he asked him a third time, kind of shots fired at Peter for the first time. You know, he denied him three times. So he asked him three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. It was a little jab at him. Do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said once again, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then Jesus said to Peter, simply follow me. Jesus wanted Peter back and wanted Peter to follow him. So, church, will we follow Jesus? Will we follow him? Will we follow Jesus who is the first one to extend his hand, to pick you up, to get you out of that sin that you're in, to wash you white as snow, to get rid of the sin in your life? But I can't force that on you. It's on you and your own personal relationship with Jesus. We talked about, again, purpose and presence. And the presence is important. When we are in the throne room of God and he says, why should I let you into the kingdom? Because we know him. Not because of what we did, because we simply know Jesus. Or, will Jesus say away from me, I never knew you. So now we're going to get back to wisdom in this last part, part four. Everyday living. And so Stuart says this gift can be used in everyday living situations. When problems are, arise, when everyday problems arise, we are told to ask for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James 1 verse 5. And so thus God will grant us wisdom on how to live a consistent life that is glorifying to him. We see here that when problems arise, 
We need to ask for wisdom. So I know for a fact, we all can get stung by life. We can have these storms of life that come in and we can get zapped by the lightning that extends from these storms. They can hit and they make you feel isolated. They make you feel alone. They make you full of doubt and pain. You have no idea what to do. You have no idea what kind of decision you're going to have to make. And you feel utterly helpless. So when all this pressure and the pain of life keeps adding up and up and you feel like you're going to perish, those are the times that we need to have a shelter so that we can be protected and know what to do during these storms so that not a little five mile an hour wind can just come over and knock over your shelter. We need to be firm. We need to be strong. And what the shelter looks like, it, there's an answer for it right here in this passage that we're in today in verses six through eight, which says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So instead of being trampled by life and destroyed by these storms that we may be enduring, we need to believe to receive. So if our shelter is built by our trust in God and that knowing that he loves us more than anything we can ever imagine. And that he alone, only him, not your own will, but he alone is the one that will give you this wisdom to follow his will, not your own. We need to trust in his will because God knows us better than anyone or anything ever will. He created you. He made you in his image and his likeness. So to close, I want to challenge you and encourage you with just a few things. We have a little recap session. So don't let doubt win because that opens up the door to sin. It will kick down your door. It'll wait for you. And if you give it a foothold or any room, it'll kick down the door and you will get stung. Probably worse than what my brother did. Don't juggle with life. Don't juggle with eternity because this life is just a mere speck compared to eternal life. So instead of letting your own will be done, why don't you let the, the God who created you let his will be done. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He is full of wisdom. So we need to believe to receive. And wisdom can be applied in four ways. Through persecution, defending the faith, problem-solving, and everyday living. Love is an action, not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a verb, not a noun. God made the ultimate action of love when he sent his only son to live a perfect life, to be that ultimate sacrifice. He died, he rose again for each and every one of us. That is the only way that we can get to the Father and have eternal life through him alone. And so lastly, will you have a shelter built on trust and love so that God can pour into you wisdom and that you have a personal relationship with him that it's presence over Oh, this is just what gives me purpose. It's presence, a relationship. It's not religion full of rules. It's relationship. God loves you and he wants to have this relationship with you. And it's on you if you're going to trust in him or not. He doesn't leave you, you leave him. So will you have this shelter? Or will you let these storms of life come in and knock over your shelter with just barely any effort? Or will you be strong, consider it pure joy, and allow wisdom from God to help you endure these storms of life? How will you this week believe to receive? Will you pray with me? Father God, we are all broken. 
we can admit we need saving, and even from ourselves at times. But God, you alone, you alone give us wisdom. You alone know what is best for us. You are almighty, you are sovereign, and God, you know what's best for us. You created us, you are the architect that built us. You had the perfect blueprint. And it's on us when we walk away, we choose to not love you. Your love is there always. And you give us redemption every single day that we can get up and we can endure the battles of life. We can endure these battles of life because of what your son did. Not because of what we did. The battle is already won. So God, I pray that we have this personal relationship with you so that when we, when we see you, you know us and we know you. I pray that for everyone here that we have this shelter that is built by wisdom, trust, and love in you, God. And Father, that each and every one of us this week and for our lives, that we can believe to receive. I love you and I thank you so much for your son. I pray that when people see us, that they see Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.